Good evening, and welcome in the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. He is the one we come to adore, and as I referenced briefly this morning, we really come in worship to an audience of one. It is the Lord we're here to worship, and the Bible tells us that God is invisible, We can't see him with our eyes, but we know that God is with us because he created everything. The Bible uses big words like omnipotent, which means all-powerful. The Bible uses words like omniscience in various ways to say that he's all-knowing. And so this God who is immortal, invisible, is the God we see with eyes of faith not with our our two eyes. And this is a great God, and he's so worthy of our praise, and welcome to all of you tonight. It's been a beautiful Sunday, hasn't it? I trust you were outside at least once between the morning service and the evening service to soak in your vitamin D that comes through sun and to strengthen your immune systems. But you know what? By coming to church, you strengthen your spiritual immune system. You get ready for another week of serving the Lord. And I see here that Molly, Hannah, and Audrey, and Paige are going to sing to the Lord for us in just a little while. So we're delighted, girls, that you can be here with us tonight as well. Tonight's message is going to be a simple one, but I hope it's a helpful one. It's simply entitled, Carry On, Brothers and Sisters, Carry On. And to get you focusing about what it means to carry on, I want to read an Old Testament story about a person who lived a long, long time ago, and he carried on with what God called him to do, and so the question tonight is, will we carry on with what God calls us to do in our Christian life? I'm reading from Genesis chapter 6, and it goes like this, and God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh. For the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark. For behold, I will bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, in which is the breath of life under heaven. Everything that is on the earth shall die. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall come into the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. And of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every sort into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female, of the birds according to their kinds, and of the animals according to their kinds, of every creeping thing of of the ground according to its kind. Two of every sort shall come into you to keep them alive. And then the Bible says this, Noah did this. He did all that God commanded him. Then the Lord said to Noah, go into the ark, you and your household. Have you ever wondered what it was like to build an ark for a flood that would come upon the earth and you had never seen a drop of rain? Have you ever wondered what it would have been like for Noah to take the hammer or the saw or the nails or the ropes for the very first time and start to build that big old ark? In other words... Noah carried on with what God told him to do, and he did it all by faith in the Word of God, in the promise of God. And so tonight, we're going to learn what it means to carry on for Jesus. And maybe you're struggling with that tonight. Maybe you're even backsliding from your faith. Oh, you're here physically, but maybe your heart is struggling with doubt or anxiety, or fear of the future. Well, tonight our theme is carry on, brothers and sisters, carry on. There is a God who is on his throne. So would you stand, if you are able tonight, with your brothers and sisters, and we will open with the song number four, How Great Thou Art.
Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ and through the agency and power of the Holy Spirit, we come to this congregation, this house of God to worship you tonight. We thank you so much that you are present. The Bible tells us that you inhabit the praises of your people. The Bible tells us where two or three are gathered, Lord Jesus, you are there with them. The Bible tells us that you will never leave us or forsake us. The Bible tells us that you are so willing for us to come to you through Jesus Christ. And we do tonight. We come directly to you through your Son, not through our works of righteousness, not through Mary, not through saints, not through incense or offerings, not through our own imaginations. We come through Christ who came to this earth to be the bridge between heaven and earth, and we are on your rock-solid bridge tonight, O Father. That bridge was made by the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. It will stand when the earth is no more. You will rise, O Jesus, on that great day and raise up all your family. How we praise you tonight for the Holy Spirit. Come now, Spirit. Whisper, strengthen us, come to us, awaken our hearts. May all of our hearts tonight be like a harp. May you pluck the strings and may the notes, O oh Lord, bring you glory and honor as we offer our lives to you again. It's in your name that we pray, through Jesus and Jesus alone, amen. Let's ask God to revive us again.
girls, we want a concert. That's wonderful. What, what more could we ask for when young women like you end a song in church on Sunday night with B-A-B-L-E, the Bible? That's what we want to hear. That is so wonderful. Thank you so very much for blessing us tonight. Well, let's, let's turn to our Lord in prayer right now as the Bible directs us. Our Heavenly Father, we, we hear your Son Jesus say, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. Jesus, one day, the universe as we know it, and what we can see of it through the Hubble telescope is but a fraction of your amazing universe that you spoke into being and in six days created the heavens and the earth and on the seventh day you rested. And now you tell us, Jesus, in Matthew 24, that when this earth passes away, your word will still stand. What an incredible statement. We praise you, Jesus, that you came to this earth as the Father sent you. And you were born of the Virgin Mary as the Father planned for you. And you grew up in Nazareth of Galilee as ordained by the Father under the parenting of Mary and Joseph. And we thank you, Jesus, that you grew up in the carpenter shop with your Father on earth in obedience to your Father in heaven. And we thank you, Jesus, that Luke tells us at the age of 30, you, you began your ministry and you were baptized in the Jordan River and the Spirit in the form of a dove came upon you and anointed your humanity for your ministry. And we praise you that for nearly three years, Jesus, you went about preaching and teaching the kingdom of God and healing the sick and giving sight to the blind and hearing to the deaf and loosening the tongues of the mute and cleansing the lepers and walking on water and feeding the thousands and forgiving sin. And Jesus, you are the Son of God, aren't you? You are the Son of God. No matter what people might say about you or against you, you are the Son of God. And we worship you tonight as the crucified and risen Son of God. You came to this earth and you were baptized and when you came out of the water, you heard the Father say, this is my Son, with you I am well pleased. We praise you that on the Mount of Transfiguration, your clothing became as white as wool, as white as snow. And there appeared with you Elijah and Moses. And Peter, not thinking, said, let me build three booths, one for each of you. And the heavenly Father, your Father and our Father, Jesus said to Peter, listen to my son. And Peter learned a lesson. We must never turn a deaf ear to the voice of Jesus Christ. And is there anyone listening tonight to this prayer, O Lord, who is resisting you? Maybe there's a boy or a girl. Maybe there's a, a senior saint. Maybe there's someone listening in this evening who's been resisting you, Jesus. Oh, Jesus, move their heart to hear you speak. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Jesus, we, we want to follow you. We thank you that you were despised and rejected by men and women. We thank you that you had no appearance that we would desire you. You would not be put on the cover of some fancy magazine. The media would not necessarily want to interview you. You came poor. You came weak. You came and were crucified for our sin. And we thank you tonight that you were, you were a lamb led to slaughter. Just like all 
the thousands and millions of lambs and turtle doves and pigeons and bulls that were sacrificed during that old covenant era. You went to the cross and you sacrificed yourself for us. All of our sin was placed upon you. And you were the scapegoat sent into the wilderness of our hell that we might live forever in your heaven. A hell we deserve, a heaven we don't deserve. You exchanged your righteousness and gave it to us and you took our sin upon yourself for that six hours upon the cross. We thank you, Jesus, that you not only suffered bodily but spiritually. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You cried out. Separation from your Father? We can't fathom it, O oh Jesus. The intimate love you two have shared for all eternity. The Father turned away from you in that moment when the blight of sin was upon your soul. And you were paying the price, paying the price for men, women, and children like us. And for all who have eyes to see and ears to hear your cry from the cross. But we thank you, Jesus, and let the drums and the timpanies and the horns resound that on the third day you were raised from the dead. Did the earth seem to pound he is risen again? Did the birds have a special melody that morning? The guards were overcome by the angelic presence that rolled away the tombstone, not the, so that you could walk out, but so the women could walk in and see that you were gone, the grave cloths in place, and the head cloth folded like a napkin where you were, Jesus. Thank you. You're alive tonight, and we come to worship you. We come because we love you and we need you. Thank you so much for Molly and Hannah and Audrey and Paige this evening who are learning the story about Jesus from Sunday school teachers, from grandmas and grandpas, from friends, from their older brothers and sisters if they have them, and of course from their mommies and daddies. Oh Lord, tonight we're going to learn about carrying on in our faith. It's not easy. It's not easy, Jesus. And then you look at us and you say, I know, it wasn't easy for me too. And so tonight as we learn to carry our cross over our shoulders and to drag it through this world as your cross bearer, that we would this Easter season, this, this season of Lent, this coming Holy Week, down the road a bit, that we would point people to you in any way we can, we want to see souls saved, rescued from the fire, snatched as a brand from the flames. We thank you, God, for our congregation. We pray for all who associate with this church. And we pray, Lord, that you would bless us and entrust us with souls that we can disciple and point to Jesus. So thank you tonight. Thank you for the foundation so firm, so immovable in this life that seems to be changing so rapidly in this world today. What was fashionable a decade ago is out of fashion now. What wasn't taught five years ago is being taught now, oh God, as though it's gospel truth. And we want to cry out to the world, are you really looking for gospel truth in those ways? Let us tell you about good news truth. It's the good news of Jesus, who still says in 2021, I, I am the resurrection and the life. He or she who believes in me will live and never die. What a thought. What better news can there be than through Jesus Christ, a new heavens and a new earth are soon to appear. So why would the nations try to create their own utopia and paradise on earth? Oh, help us to do good deeds and to make this world as good as we can, the best place we can, O oh Lord, even to leave it better than how we found it. But God, help us to understand 
that one day, like the days of Noah's flood, when the flood filled the earth and destroyed all that has life and breath except those on the ark, so too another catastrophe is coming. And it will be the final one when Jesus Christ returns to judge the living and the dead. And so tonight, Lord, we are here to stand on the, on the rock, the foundation of your life, death, and resurrection. And we pray this not because we are worthy of it or any better than anyone else, simply because we are sinners saved by the grace and mercy of God. Thank you tonight that we can bless you, that somehow our stammering tongues bring praise into the highest heavens. Receive our praise tonight once again. In your name we pray, amen. Let's stand and sing number 275, How Firm a Foundation. And amen to that wonderful truth. It's so important to sing truth because it lodges in the mind and the heart. It, it helps us grow stronger in our faith. It leads us to, to depths we might other, otherwise not reach apart from the truth that we sing and the truth that we hear. It's sometimes... Hard to know what to believe today, isn't it? And who to believe. And everybody is an expert in what is best for people from children on up. Well, we will continue to tell people that God knows what's best. Remember that show years ago, before my time, called Father Knows Best? Well, I, some of you are nodding, so I know what time that was for you. Well, our Heavenly Father knows best. And that's what we're saying to the world. The engineer of your humanity, the manufacturer of your spirituality, the creator of the universe made you in the image of God. The image of God. He didn't make angels in the image of God. He didn't make our dogs and cats in his image. Only human beings. From the womb to the tomb, sacred life it is. And so tonight, we're going to carry on in a very short passage of Scripture that the Lord laid upon my heart 
before Holy Week. And I find it such an encouragement because it's a, it's a message from Paul to Timothy. And of course, you know a message from Paul to Timothy in the Bible is a message through Paul and Timothy to you and me now. That's how relevant the Bible is. The Bible's been penned for quite a while now, but its relevance for our lives is current. It's as current as this morning's newspaper or internet news feeds that, that you might browse. And so tonight, in 1 Timothy 6, verses 11 through 12, I want to share with you a message called, Carry On, Brothers and Sisters, Carry On. I hope it's an encouragement tonight for all of us to keep persevering in our faith as the church and saints have for, for generations. And so, if you would look at these two verses, and I encourage you to keep your Bible before you as we look at them, because there's four leading thoughts in these two verses that I want to simply unfold for you tonight. Paul writes, But as for you, O man of God, flee these things. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, a short reading tonight, but a powerful and I pray strategic message for us tonight. I don't know for whom this will target the bullseye of their heart, for whom it will target the next ring out and the next ring out. But I know it will speak. And so pull your heavenly arrow out of its quiver, O oh Lord. Tip it with your love, mercy, and grace and pull back the bowstring and may the Holy Spirit direct it to hearts that need it in an appropriate way. Through Jesus Christ we pray, amen. Life is not easy. Life can be very hard for families, for those who are single, for widows and widowers. I talk with seniors occasionally who say something like, Life is just so quickly moving past me today. I don't understand computers or smartphones, and so I have my grandchildren teach me. And I say, that's good. Let them teach away. But don't you forget to teach them what they don't know. They may know about smartphones and computers, but you know a thing or two about Jesus, the Bible, and truth in a world that seems to barter truth away for a price. Can you remember when you first trusted Jesus Christ? Some people can. Many of us in the Reformed tradition can't. We, we grew up believing, and it's hard for us to imagine a time we did not believe. But even in that situation, there are Christians who can remember when God became very real and their commitment to Christ became equally as real. That may not mean they didn't know Christ before savingly, but it may mean that they didn't know him intimately. God and his salvation is a beautiful mystery. But I want you to think about how much you and Jesus have been through together. Has your life, since you gave your heart to Jesus Christ, unfolded as planned? 
Have there been knuckleballs and curveballs thrown over the home plate of your heart? Have you swung and missed more times than you ever thought you would? Welcome to Christianity. Welcome to a journey with Jesus Christ that will take you beyond anything you could have ever imagined for yourself. We look back now at some of the deepest, scariest trials of life, and we say, Lord, I've trusted you more because of that trial. And we know that we have trials yet to come, and we know, praise God, from whom all blessings flow, that he only allots the trials that he knows we can endure in his strength. And he strengthens us, and then the next one might be a little more difficult. What a God we have. Tonight, my exhortation to you is to carry on. It's not my exhortation alone. It comes from the Bible. It comes from 1 Timothy 6, verses 11 and 12. And the Apostle Paul is saying two basic words to Timothy in these verses. Carry on, Timothy. Carry on. And I, I say to you tonight, as a new pastor in your midst, carry on, dear Christian. Carry on in your faith. Carry on in what you've been taught since childhood. Carry on in what you believe. Carry on for Jesus' sake and for Jesus' name. Carry on for the church. Carry on for your spouse. Carry on for your children and carry on for your grandchildren. Carry on for the kingdom of God and carry on for the glory of God that you give him every time you carry on and you want to stop and turn the other way. Paul is instructing Timothy in the basics of pastoral ministry. Long have Paul's words to Timothy and Titus been close to my heart because I was once a young pastor and I'm no longer young and moving on through life, but these words still speak to my heart. Paul is nearing the end of his life, and so they ring with greater clarity and urgency to all who read them. You'll notice in verse 11 that Paul says, but as for you, O man of God. Let's stop right there. O man of God is a precious, precious phrase. Paul is borrowing it from the Old Testament where it was used of prophets, where it was used of spiritual leaders in Israel. They were called prophets. Men of God in those days. And Paul knows that Timothy is timid by nature. He doesn't have Paul's natural courage, yet alone his spiritual courage. And Timothy has been a little hesitant, a little timid as a young pastor. And so Paul writes his two letters to Timothy to encourage him to carry on. And by calling him, O oh, man of God, he's giving him credit. He's saying, I see you as I see Elijah and the prophets of the Old Testament. You're a man of God like they are. And you know how important it is to speak into the lives of people what you hope them to be, even though they may not be there yet. A young mom and dad speak into their children's lives certain words and abilities that they can see the, the potential, but they haven't been reached yet. And so they speak it and say, you're going to be faithful someday. You're going to be able to do this someday. You, you, you build them up by pointing them in a direction, and you pray for the south wind to come and warm the heart of what you say to those kids. All men and women, however, fit this passage tonight. It's not directed simply to men. It's it's man of God and woman of God. It's men of God and women of God to which we are focusing our thoughts tonight. And wherever you are tonight, regardless of age, physical weakness, or strength, whether your faith is struggling or you're wrestling with doubt or you have those lingering question marks of God in your mind and heart, whether you're in pain or whether you're singing in the rain tonight, Jesus Christ is calling you and me to carry on together in four ways. Let's look at them together. Number one, Paul says in verse 11, 
carry on and keep fleeing from sin. He writes, but as for you, O man of God, flee these things. Now the word flee, like the word pursue and the word fight and the word take hold, these are in the imperative mood. They're all four commands. And, and Paul says, I command you, Timothy, to flee these things. And you ask, what things? Well, Paul has been writing in verses 3 through 10 of various sorts of sins that he wants Timothy to avoid as a pastor. You'll notice in verse 3 he talks about different doctrine that does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness. He says, flee that different doctrine. Flee the words of our Lord Jesus Christ that people despise and reject. Flee them when they do. Isn't that happening today? Jesus has his words that he spoke on earth printed for us in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And of course, the whole Bible is the word of God. But people today are doing exactly what Paul writes about in verse 3. They do not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ. They, they are denying them. There's been groups in the last 30 years who pick and choose which words of Jesus from the Bible they're going to hold on to and which they're not. It's all the inspired word of God. He goes on in verse 4 to say that some of these people are puffed up with conceit and they understand nothing. And they have an unhealthy craving for controversies and quarrels. He says in verse 5 that they're depraved in mind and deprived of the truth. That's a strong way of saying that when you deny the words of Jesus Christ, you are depraved in mind and denying the truth. Because all that Jesus spoke is true. Jesus did not lie, he could not sin. He goes on to say that there's people who actually imagine that godliness is a means of financial gain. In other words, they're pursuing the Lord because they think out of it they're going to get a lot of money. Paul writes that we need to be content with godliness. We've brought nothing into the world and we cannot take anything out of the world. He goes on that some who desire to be rich, fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. And then he says, the love of money, not money itself, but the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. And some have wandered from the faith from this. And then he says, Timothy, but as for you, flee these things. In other words, Timothy, if we were to put it all together, he's saying, flee sin. Flee all kinds of sin. Paul warned Timothy to flee from sin. And I just say to you tonight from this simple exhortation of Paul to Timothy, flee from sin. Carry on, brothers and sisters, and flee from sin. We all have a susceptibility to sin. There's no question about it. We're still men and women who have been taken from dust, and to dust we will return. But a man or a woman of God seeks to flee from sin. It is a disposition in the heart deposited by the Holy Spirit that leads us or inclines us to want to flee from sin. Sin seems to be almost everywhere today, doesn't it? You wonder where you can go to get away from this sinful world, this wicked and evil devil, and of course, the sin of our own heart. Our hearts are like a tinderbox filled with kerosene, and one match can strike, and we sin before we even know it. That flame of sin can burn hot. It can burn long, and we need to flee from sin in the strength of the Holy Spirit. I was visiting with a friend a few days ago, and he said, Mike, I was reading the Bible, and Something dawned on me for the first time in my life. And I said, well, what was it? And he said, the Bible makes no sense apart from sin. And I said to him, that is profound. Put that down in your little notebook as one of your great quips. I've never heard it put that way before, but it's very true. The Bible does not make sense apart from sin. 
the whole canon of Scripture from Genesis to Revelation is the story of how sin entered the world, of how Jesus died for the sin of the world, and how it's going to be conquered in the end forever. The Bible does not make sense without a doctrine of sin. Humanity does not make sense without a doctrine of humanity. Fallen governments and institutions do not make sense without a doctrine of sin. And today, it seems as though people are throwing away the doctrine of sin, the doctrine of our depravity, of our sinful flesh and nature. That as David cried out in Psalm 51, in sin did my mother conceive me. He's not saying his mother was sinning. He's saying from conception on, I was part of Adam's sin, part of Eve's sin. Sin and our new nature do not mix. And we will sin as we do unfortunately, yet in this life. But when you carry on and flee from sin, you will grow in your hatred of sin. I hinted at this this morning. Proverbs 8, 13 says, the fear of the Lord is hatred of sin. So as we grow in our fear of God, I take it to mean that as we love the Lord and we are in awe and respect of who God is, our, our hatred of those times when we do sin grows over the years. It doesn't mean we will stop sinning. It may mean that we slow down. But it does mean that we're hearing God say like he does in Psalm 97.10. And this is so beautiful because God understands that we're sinners, right? That's why he sent Christ. I mean, don't be embarrassed that, that you sin. You are a sinner, that's why he sent the Christ to die for our sin. But as a Christian now being sanctified, we want to grow in our hatred of sin. In fact, in Psalm 97 verse 10, we read, O oh, you who love the Lord, hate evil. And I say the same thing to you tonight. If you love the Lord, grow in your hatred of evil. It's as though the Lord is imploring us from heaven. You love me. I know you love me. You spend time in prayer. You're a loving person. You follow my word. But let me encourage you in this area. Grow, if you love me, in your hatred of sin. And this means that we choose daily to flee from sin. You know, whether it's on the internet or television or romance novels or movies or whatever, Grow in such a way as a Christian that when you hear God's name taken in vain or you see some sultry scene in some movie that you wouldn't be watching if Jesus was in the same room with you. Well, I'm here to tell you tonight, Jesus is in every room and in every place you and I will ever be. You want to live with this awareness that Christ is with me and that's something we grow into. We don't come by it with our nature. It's something the Holy Spirit produces. And that's what Paul wants Timothy to understand when he says, flee, flee, Timothy. Carry on and flee from sin. It's a strong word. It means get out of there. Run, depart. Don't give in. Don't coddle. Don't flirt with. Don't be so close to the line between righteousness and sin, that you're living in this danger zone. Ephesians 4.30 is so precious, isn't it? And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed from the day for the day of redemption. So when I sin, I grieve the Spirit. And the gracious, merciful influences of the Spirit that give me more of Jesus just, just kind of wane. They kind of subside. And then when we confess our sin, those beautiful influences of the Holy Spirit return with greater power. Praise God for forgiveness. In Ephesians chapter 5, verses 10 through 12, we read this. Now, I'll, I'll capture it for you right here. Paul writes, try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things they do in secret. Notice, there's, there's a shamefulness 
of even speaking of the things that people do in secret, that kind of sin. Paul says in Ephesians 5 as well, don't even let there be a hint of sexual immorality in your life. And you say, a hint, Paul, it's everywhere today. What do I do? Flee. Potiphar's wife steals your cloak like she did Joseph, and you run for the hills. You're like Joseph who said in Genesis 39, verse 9, how, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Think of what happens when we don't flee from sin. It's hard, I know, to think about how it grieves the heart of God, grieves the spirit of God, and grieves the Christ of God. But praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here and below. Praise him above. The heavenly hosts, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. He forgives us, amen? Does he forgive us? Yes, he does. And we start again. So the first exhortation tonight is carry on and keep fleeing from sin. And if you're stuck tonight, if you're on the George Jetson treadmill and you keep going around and around with that same battle, maybe it's time to flee. If your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. If your right hand causes you to sin, lop it off and throw it away, says Jesus in Matthew 5. Of course, he's using a metaphor. In other words, do whatever you have to do by the power of the Spirit to flee from that sin. Number two, he says, carry on and keep pursuing a holy life. Notice this at the end of verse 11. After telling him to flee these things, he now says, Timothy, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Notice those beautiful virtues of righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, and gentleness. We can summarize all these beautiful virtues and simply say they are evidence of holiness, of holiness. In other words, adorn your neck with righteousness, faith, and love, and steadfastness, and let that necklace, let that way of life be yours as you seek more of Jesus Christ. Together, these virtues, Paul lists, were obvious character traits of Jesus Christ, but together they comprise the holy life, holy character traits. And so Paul told Timothy to pursue a holy life. That word is sort of out of fashion today. Nobody on ESPN or any of the networks will ever tell us as they sign off for the night, hey, Hope you're pursuing holiness. I'll never hear that at a movie theater. I'll never hear it over the radio, except a Christian station maybe. But I'm going to tell you tonight what the Bible is telling us to do. Pursue holiness. The whole word holy is simply a life devoted to God. A life devoted to the Lord. Carry on and pursue it. If fleeing sin is running from sin... Pursuing holiness is running to Jesus because he's the holy one. Peter writes in 1 Peter 1 verses 15 and 16, As he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. Who has called us? Our God, our Savior, our Lord, the Spirit called us. So as he who called you into salvation is holy, so be holy in all you do, for it is written, Peter says, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Hold that standard. Don't lower the bar. You're not going to always jump over it, but it's there. God doesn't lower the standard for any generation, does he? He is still holy. The commandments are still ten because they flow from his eternal character. Well, how do I pursue a holy life? Well, by faith, we pursue it. We seek, abide, and lean on Jesus Christ, and we study him together. The holy life is a hard life, and only those saved by grace can pursue it. And let me add this for a moment. Pursuing the holy life for us is not about being better than somebody else. 
It's not about trying to impress other people. It's not even about trying to be more useful in service to Christ. The root desire why we are to pursue holiness is because we want to be more like Jesus. We just want to be conformed to the likeness of our Lord more and more. And if you get frustrated because you struggle with this, that is healthy. You see, I have a lot of people who tell me about the struggles they have with this or that sin. And I say to them, you know what? Just the fact that you're bothered by it is healthy. That means you are alive in Jesus and he wants you to keep going and carrying on. You see, the struggle isn't evidence that you're outside the faith. The struggle is evidence that you're well inside the faith and God is developing and growing you over the years he has you on this earth. Holiness is also hard because unholiness is everywhere. There seems to be today no standards on television, movies, the internet. It's in your face daily. But you can choose to pursue holiness every day. The Bible says to do it this way. Put off your earthly nature and put on righteousness, godliness, by the power of the Holy Spirit. We can't do this on our own, can we? I mean, we need to get before the Lord and we say, Lord, I am, I am so small, I am so weak. If I'm left to myself for a moment, I explode with sin. These thoughts will drive me crazy. My attitudes will drive me nuts. Lord, I need you. I need you to sober up my spiritual life. I love my spouse. I want to be faithful. I love my children. I want to honor you. I want to teach them well. God, help me. So, pursue holiness even as you're fleeing from sin number three. Carry on, brothers and sisters. Carry on and keep fighting for the faith, Paul tells Timothy. Notice verse 12. It's another imperative, another command. Timothy, fight the good fight of the faith. And of course, as Paul's writing this, he's He's bruised, he's been flogged, he bears the marks of Jesus on his body. He knows a thing or two about fighting. And you know what? He never once raised his fists. He never once fought back in that way. He just said, Jesus loves you, and I serve this Jesus Notice that Paul says, fight the good fight of the faith. The word fight, as I mentioned, is a command the first time you read it. The second time, it simply means contest. Fight the good fight, the good contest of the faith. And the Greek word fight that begins verse 12 is agonizomai, agonize. It's where we get our English word agonize. And so what Paul is saying is agonize over the good contest of of the faith. Your faith is a noble thing, and he wants you to, to sweat and work and labor and cry out that your faith may not fail. Remember, Jesus said, Peter, I prayed that your faith will not fail. But when Satan sifts you, then you will return to me. Peter's faith failed when he denied his Lord three times. But he came back to the Lord as the Lord offered him grace and mercy and forgiveness. Keep on the good fight of the faith. It's just the faith, you, the faith of the gospel, the faith you have in Jesus Christ. Carry it on and keep fighting for it. Be relentless in your spiritual life. I think too many of us as Christians are, are passive. We, we sit back and wait. But there is a place for active Christianity where you go forward and you pursue and you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. So we must agonize. It's a struggle. It's a struggle. You agonize in prayer. You agonize over the Bible. You read good Christian literature. You listen to good music. You 
understand something of the creeds and confessions of the Reformed Church that we need to restore in our congregations. But above all, <laughs> above all, I think the, the fight is about loving Christ, loving Jesus most of all. See, the battle in your heart and mine is not whether or not I believe in Jesus if we're Christian. We believe. The battle is, will we love Christ more and more? Will we treasure him? Remember, David wrote in Psalm 63, Oh God, you are my God, earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you, my body longs for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. I mean, he longed for God as a deer pants for streams of water. So ask yourself tonight, how much do I want God? How much more of God do I push on to have in my life? You want to be made of the right stuff. I came across a cute little, little saying, a little brown cork fell in the path of a whale who lashed it down with his angry tail. But in spite of its blows, it quickly arose and floated serenely before his nose. Said the cork to the whale, you may flap and sputter and frown, but you never, never, never can keep me down. For I am made of the stuff that is buoyant enough to float instead of to drown. <laughs> How's your stuff tonight? Are you like that little cork in the presence of the whale? When the great temptations of your life come and the, they're splashing around and you feel like you're bobbing all over and you go down for a while, you'll rise again. You'll rise again because Christ is your Savior. He is your forgiver. He is your Lord. He rose again. They couldn't keep Christ down, and they can't keep a man or a woman of God down who knows Jesus Christ. So carry on. I know the race is difficult. Carry on. I know you've got some bruises and scars and wounds. Carry on. I know that there's a little bit of life left for all of us in here, but soon the race will be over. And as James, Jesus' biological earthly brother, wrote in chapter 1 of his book that bears his name, Blessed is the man or woman who perseveres under trial, for when he or she has stood the test, they will receive the crown of life that will never pass away. Fourth and finally tonight, we are to carry on. And keep fleeing from sin. We are to carry on and keep pursuing holiness. We are to carry on and keep fighting the good fight of the faith. And we are to carry on and keep taking hold of eternal life. Now look at this last exhortation. Timothy, he says, you, man of God, take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. He takes Timothy's back to his ordination day when he knelt down before elders and pastors somewhere and they put their hands on him and they prayed over him and he became a pastor. For me, it was June 4, 1989 in the Hospers Reformed Church. I can remember it like it was yesterday. They gathered around me. I got on my knees. I was tear-filled. I was trembling. I said, God, I don't know if I can do this. And all of a sudden, their hands came upon me, and they prayed, and it was done in about 10 minutes. And I stood up, and I said the words that we read as an installed pastor at a classis. And I said, oh, Lord, what is this all about? Where's it going to lead? What's my life going to be like from this point on? And Paul says to us, as he said to Timothy, Take hold of your eternal life. I tell you, Timothy was timid by nature, and I have a little bit of that too. We all do in the presence of certain people, don't we? But you know what? When you know that Jesus Christ has you, you can stand before whatever Goliath Satan sends before you We are not our own, are we? But we belong in body and soul, in life and in death to our faithful Savior, Jesus Christ, who has fully paid for all our sins with his precious blood and has set us free from the tyranny of the devil. 
In fact, he watches over us in such a way that not a, not a brown hair, not a gray hair, not a red hair, not a blue hair can fall from your head without the will of your Father in heaven. Because I belong to him, Christ, by his Holy Spirit, assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly and ready from now on to live for him. What does it mean to take hold of eternal life? We struggle with this. And the main reason is this. We think eternal life is future. Full eternal life is future. But do you know that eternal life is in your heart tonight? The seed of eternal life is already yours because the spirit of eternal life is within you. The only thing separating you from heaven is your body. The moment the physical body gives away. The, the distance between earth and heaven is so razor thin that you take your last breath on earth and your first breath in heaven and you say, what was I afraid of? Ah, death conquered by my Savior. I had nothing to fear. Oh, God, thank you for welcoming me into heaven, but now, now to take hold of it, to cling to it, to grasp it, this is hard, but study eternal life. Think often of eternal life. Walk through a cemetery. I challenge you and ponder your mortality. If you've stopped putting on your glasses when you look in the mirror in the morning or the day, put them back on and see that you are growing older and that you're going to leave this life sooner than you probably imagine. But don't ever let that get you down. That's what you're here for. That's what we're prepared for. The greatest moment of testing for your faith and mine will be the last moment we are on earth. That's the final test you and I will ever have. And what God is saying here and what Timothy needed to know and maybe what you need to know tonight is that we have to take hold of eternal life now in this life. It's coming so very soon. And you say, well, I want to live another 50 years. I want you to live another 50 years too. Praise God. But compared to eternity, that soon. <laughs> it's all relative, isn't it? I look at some of you tonight who are in your 70s, and I think maybe your 80s. Oh, you've been through a lot. But he's carried you, hasn't he? So carry on tonight. Keep fleeing from sin, pursuing holiness, fighting the good fight, no matter how hard and how many times you get knocked down in the ring. And keep taking hold of eternal life. And never forget Sow a thought, reap an action. Sow an action, reap a habit. Sow a habit, reap a character. And sow a character, and you reap a destiny. Carry on. This one person writes, press on, though the mists obscure the steep and rugged way, and clouds of doubt beset, soon dawns the brighter day. Keep on, though hours seem long and days deep fraught with woe. Let patience have her perfect work and vanquish every foe. Hope on, though all is lost and storms beat high. Have faith in Christ. Be still and know that God is nigh. Children, that word nigh means near. Old-fashioned way of saying it. Carry on, brothers and sisters. Carry on. Amen. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for Paul's simple but powerful instruction for us tonight. You are our God in ages past, our, our help for years to come. And may we continue to carry on and Link arms together as your brothers and sisters, O oh Jesus, as we travel 
to one day see you face to face. In your name we pray, amen. Let's stand and sing our closing hymn, O God, our help in ages past. Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good for doing his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Go in peace. Carry on. Mm -hmm.